So what we're going to talk about today is a continuation of this um, revolution in the economy. Uh, we've been discussing capitalism and its development in uh, first the American colonies and eventually the United States. We also know that this has all kinds of implications when it comes to our political system and to some extent our social relations as well. Certainly we will talk about that further uh, in, later in the semester, but for right now, I want to talk to you about the Industrial Revolution as it relates to American history. The first thing I want you to understand is the Industrial Revolution itself. This was not really something that originated in the Americas, let alone the United States. This was something that pretty much came from Europe and especially Great Britain. Um, I've said this before in this class. Uh, Great Britain was the workshop of the world. That's where things and products were produced. And as a consequence, they became a very wealthy nation and a very powerful nation. Over the course of the 18th and early 19th century, you generally see industrialization coming to the United States as well. What I want you to write down for industrial revolution is pretty simple. It is a process, a process whereby human or animal power is replaced by machine power. Human or animal power replaced by machine power. I know we've talked about this to some extent before in this class, but um, really what this is about is producing more with less. Machines don't ask for time off. They never get sick. Um, they never ask for a raise. They can run morning, noon, and night. In short, you can produce a lot more and probably a lot more efficiently than with human or even animal power. Now, a good example as to how industrialization will really reinvent the economic wheel in the United States, of all things, is going to be clocks. Um, I don't know that you could really point to a skill, uh, a, a skilled trade, a, a profession, really, than, that, that was bigger or, or more intricate than clock making. Um, there's a reason why Rolex watches cost so much money, um, and it's because, you know, to get it to run the way that uh, a high-end watch like that would, would, would run, um, you've got to be a very, very skilled mechanic, very skilled craftsman, years and years of your life dedicated to learning how this whole thing works. Well, along come a couple guys from Connecticut, um, a guy by the name of Eli Terry and Seth Thomas. And what they're going to do is invent um, something at the time that was known as the box clock. Now, this is going to sound very archaic to you, but we live in a much later time period. You know, we've got our smart watches and digital watches and, you know, all of these things. You can check the clock on your phone or tablet or whatever you're carrying these days. But at the time, the idea of a box clock was, was really cutting-edge technology. It was exactly what it sounds like it is. Um, it was a clock that sat on top of a ledge, uh, a lot of times a mantle above a fireplace, and it was in the shape of a box. Um, but the idea of being able to, to, to know what time it was um, without poking your head out the window and taking a look at the clock tower, um, that really was advanced um, technology for the time. But the problem, as you might imagine, is they were very expensive, and that was because it took this skilled mechanic. It took a lot of man hours to produce these things. Well, along come Terry and Thomas, and what they do is they, is they find a revolutionary way to produce these things. And part of this is about bringing the work to the worker, okay? It's not as if they're going to have a skilled clockmaker make you a clock from the ground up. What they're going to do is more or less introduce the concept of an assembly line. Now, truth be told, the assembly line had been in, in the works for, for many years before them, certainly many years after them. Um, as you can tell, it originates a long, long time before Henry Ford really perfects it in the early 20th century. In any case, what these guys are going to do is they're going to divide uh, the labor inside the factory. The assembly line is going to bring the work to the worker, whereby one guy will do nothing but put the face of the clock on the inner workings of the clock. The next guy will install the gears. The next guy will install the glass. And the process just goes on and on and on down the line until you have a ready-to-consume, it's ready-to-tell-you-what-time-it-is clock. 
this really is a revolutionary way of um, producing things in American life, and it's a very good example of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. The other thing that it's going to do, you might be guessing this, is it's going to eliminate um, skilled trade categories. Keep in mind, clock making was a very skilled profession, it really was a profession, and it's going to put some people out of work. In a way, it's not that much different than what we were talking about with respect to those shoemakers. What you're going to see is very similar to what happened in shoes. You're going to see the markets expand for box clocks, and pretty soon it's going to be large producers like Terry and Thomas that will dominate in first at first regions and eventually national markets. And so over the course of time, what you're going to see is a de-skilling process, the, the process of taking the skill away from the worker so that this one worker only does one job. It's pretty much a job just about anybody off the street can do, but they do it again and again and again. Is this good? Well, yeah, because it's bringing down prices. It's allowing more of us regular middle class consumers to buy these cool things. Is it bad? Yeah, it's throwing people like our good friend Sam Patch, who was also a skilled trade worker. It's throwing those people out of business. So it's, um, it's a double edged sword and it cuts both ways, as you can see. But for right now, I want to go ahead and push this envelope. I introduced you to Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, a few lectures ago, and I told you that it was one of America's first industrial boom towns. It was a town that really grew up around the textile industry. And at first they recruited many, many farm girls from those New England uh, small towns uh, because they understood, Francis Cabot Lowell, for example, understood that you could get away with paying them less. As we get deeper and deeper into the 19th century, we are going to see immigrants coming from really all over Europe, but especially Ireland. Because what begins to happen in the 1830s, and especially the 1840s, is that the potato crop, which accounted for close to 90% of the Irish diet, it begins to fail. And when it begins to fail, people begin to starve. And when they begin to starve, they begin to come to places like Great Britain and the United States. And the reason is very simple. Our economies are industrializing, and what we need a lot of is workers and not necessarily skilled workers people like mechanics or you know shoemakers we need people that are more or less warm bodies that can do one job over and over and over again once again the big winners are going to be the people that own the factories the losers if you want to look at them that way would be those ladies that had been working in the factories before irish immigrants german immigrants and other european immigrants began showing up because the Irish in particular are showing up so desperate for work, so desperate for money, they're generally willing to work for next to nothing. Um, what this does is it makes it really difficult for those ladies that had begun to kind of see themselves as a class and a class that was essentially oppressed, makes it really difficult for them to lobby for their rights there's somebody that is newly arrived and they're willing to do this job for less money and they're willing to do it without complaint. And so therefore that puts these ladies of Lowell, Massachusetts in a difficult position when it comes to leveraging for rights inside the factory and outside as well as uh, too. So part of this would not have been possible had it not been for improved technology. And what you see is the establishment of what I like to think of the Texas Tech of its day, the Georgia Tech, if you will, of its day. It was known as the Franklin Institute, named after Benjamin Franklin, because he was this amateur engineer that just liked to take things apart and put them back together again. In any case, the Franklin Institute um, was the place where these, shall we say, tinkerers, uh, they came to compare notes. Uh, scientists, researchers, people that wanted to find better ways to produce whatever it was that they were producing. And they're, they're kind of comparing notes and they're, they're, they're figuring out better, more efficient, more proficient ways of doing things. And this is lending itself to American industry as well. Um, again, the big, big winners are those individuals that are owning the factory because what this is ultimately doing is lending itself to the de-skilling process and as we've already established, the less and less skill that goes into something, the lower you can pay for your wages. If you can just pluck somebody right off of the street, they can do as good 
a job as whoever it was that was working there two weeks ago, then, then why would you pay that other person top dollar in terms of wages? This is very good for those individuals like Francis Cabot Lowell, like Samuel Slater that, that own the factories. Okay? There are individuals that begin to realize that their worlds, as they knew it, were very much in jeopardy. Um, I've introduced you to the idea of a guild. This was a collection, a alliance, if you will, of skilled tradesmen that guaranteed quality and fairness in the marketplace. But as the markets expanded and, and, and as, as, as craftsmen, master craftsmen became what you and I would call bosses and what journeymen uh, came to be what you and I would call employees, they're going to give rise. The situation is going to give rise to what you and I would call unions. These are collections of people. But they're not just collections of people that produce shoes or textiles or something. They're workers. They, they work underneath a boss. They work for a wage. And they're coming to the realization that these, these bosses, these people that own the factories, the means of production, they have a lot of leverage over them. And they're using that leverage in a lot of ways against them. And they're using them to pay less and less in the form of wages. They're, they're using it to get them to work more and more hours in more and more dangerous working conditions. A couple examples that I'd like you to be familiar with would be the Philadelphia Journeyman House Carpenters that demanded shorter work days. And they did so for a very specific reason. They wanted more time to read. Um, they felt that reading was a very important part of life and that workers and people that owned uh, factories alike should be entitled to uh, that, that standard of living, that that should not be something, leisure time is what you and I would call it, uh, but that should not be something that just only the super wealthy or even the well-to-do enjoyed. It ought to be an American right. Um, another group that I'd like you to be mindful of would be the General Trade Union. Now, this really starts out in New York but it's an association of workers, and I'm using air quotes here primarily because it wasn't just people that worked in a clock factory or a textile factory or any kind of factory, but workers from all walks of life and all economic backgrounds in New York City. And what they're going to do is they are going to uh, get together and they're going to conduct work stoppages, refuse to go back to work until uh, their employers um, either recognize their unions and bargain collectively with them or meet their demands for a better payday or a shorter working day or something along those lines. They're also going to lead demonstrations. Um, you are going to see people that are wearing their displeasure, their discontent on their sleeve, and uh, they're, they're, they're not afraid to let people know it. You're beginning to see a consciousness uh, emerge here. People are beginning to realize that the private ownership of means of production really empowers those individuals that own the factories. And somewhere, Thomas Jefferson is saying, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so. Anyway, back to our, um, our, our story. Uh, the last group that I'd like you to be mindful of would be the National Trades Union. And again, this is an inter-sort of worker alliance. It's not made up of one industry as opposed to another. Um, and it's established in August 1834. And at its height, it's going to it's going to represent more than 25,000 workers. Now, now, this is not just in New York. This is really all up and down the eastern seacoast and even into parts of uh, what we would probably call the Midwest today. But my point here, guys, is that people have come to a realization uh, that these these people that own the factories have a very um, a, a, a very unique power over them. And they're beginning to control their lives. Um, one example that I think might help to put all of this into some perspective for you is a lady from Massachusetts by the name of Harriet Martineau. That might sound familiar to you because we've had uh, an assignment that did involve Harriet Martineau, who wrote this piece that I asked you to read entitled The Morals of the Manufacturers. And by manufacturers, who she really means is she means the bosses, the people that own the factories. And what she's really upset about is not necessarily that they control the lives of these working class women in places like Lowell. Um, of course, if you're going to pay me to do a job, then certainly you have the right and 
uh, the privilege of telling me how you want that job done and when I get to go home and all that good stuff. But when the whistle blows and my shift ends, my time is my time. If you're not paying me, you should have the right to tell me what I can and can't do. The problem, as Martineau sees it, is that that's exactly what these bosses are doing. And she uses the example of attending dance class, right? Many of you got that in that assignment, that it was the attending of dance class that the bosses didn't like. Um, the bosses are saying that any lady that attends dance class would no longer have a job at the factory. And they base that decision on the idea that you can't really be as productive for the next day at work if you're out dancing all night. Well, that may or may not be, but in my opinion, and I would bet many of you are right there with me, um, in my opinion, if you if you go out and you can dance all night, you show up the next morning and you don't skip a beat at work, then it's not really any of your boss's business what you're doing on your private time. They're not paying you, so they should not have that ability. But because many of these ladies do, in fact, need that job, need, not want, but need that job, um, they're not really in a position to say no. And this is uh, Martineau's really big problem with the morals of the manufacturers and the excessive amounts of, as she sees it, power that they exercise over their workers. Another very good example um, that you need a lot of miles out of to understanding this is a guy from Rhode Island by the name of Jeff Luther. Now, I know that you know that Rhode Island, like Massachusetts, is one of these hotbeds of industrialization. Um, Slatersville, Rhode Island, uh, lots of textile factories. Our good friend Sam Patch works at one of them. But Seth Luther was one of these working class activists who happened to be from Rhode Island. And what Luther was really worried about is what he called the aristocracy of capital. If you've been following along during this unit, you've heard me talk about um, the feudal landed aristocracy in uh, in Europe. Um, you know, this, these are people that were landowners and their families had passed that land down from one generation to the next. And the aristocracy was the ruling elite class of Europe for years and years and years before the development of what we call capitalism. What Luther worried about was not capitalism per se, but but capitalism kind of evolving into what feudalism was for all those years, which was a situation where capital, not land per se, but capital, um, the factories, uh, the machines, the, uh, the, the money or the access to money, uh, the capital, the, the means of production was handed down from one generation to the next generation. You can see that to some extent in the, in the 21st century. Uh, if you were to look at uh, somebody like Paris Hilton, the heiress of to this massive hotel uh, chain, um, you know, part of the reason why she's very, very wealthy and will probably remain very wealthy is because her parents were, 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 were in charge of this hotel empire. And the reason that they were very, very wealthy and powerful was because their parents were very, very wealthy and powerful. Now, Thankfully, Luther felt that there was a um, solution to this aristocracy of capital. We could preserve this American experiment in democracy, and that was by ex extending the franchise to, to all men, regardless of their incomes, educations, background, or conditions of their labor. Now, the franchise, what I mean by that is the vote. Um, what Seth Luther wanted was working class men to have the right to vote. All men, as far as Luther was concerned, all white men, we are still in a very racist time period in American history, but that's another story. We'll get to that later. In any case, he felt that extending the vote to all men, uh, working class, middle class, and of course, those people that own the means of production, counts no more, no less than one what that would do is it would neutralize the power that that aristocracy of capital held over the working man. In other words, what we could do if we saw people, those individuals that Harriet Martineau had referenced, using and abusing their power when they didn't have any right to do so, what we could do in those situations is elect 
shall we say, working class friendly politicians that would make rules that say you can't do that. That's illegal. And if you don't stop doing it, we're going to use the powers of the government to stop you from doing it. As you might imagine, there were very few fans of this, of the upper class variety, of those people that own the means of production. And you see this very vividly in 1842 in what historians refer to as the Door Rebellion. What the Door Rebellion really was, was this big struggle. It was, think of it like a miniature civil war. I mean, you do have the use of violence in Rhode Island. And what the working class activists that are fighting their bosses, what they want is the right to vote. Now, ultimately, we do get exactly that. But I need you to understand it has not always been that way. At least in certain locations, it's not always been that way. Part of the reason that we do think of voting the way that we presently do, a lot of that should be attributed to people like Harriet Martineau, or especially in this case, Seth Luther. Where I want to go with this, a lot of these activists, a lot of these critics of this new industrial order started pointing to a concept that they called artisan republicanism. The concept being, we, we have a form of government that is not inherited. It's the opposite of a monarchy. We have a republic. And these individuals insinuated that there was once a golden era in American politics where it was your small shopkeepers, it was your skilled craftsmen, your artisans that, um, that comprised the heart of this republic. It was they that voted men into office and voted them out when they did not do a good job. It was they that held the positions of authority in the first place, positions within politics. And in their mind, what really changed all of this, and not in a good way, was the development and overall evolution of this capitalist system. And I told you this when we began this unit. They're not necessarily against capitalism per se, what they're against is the parts of capitalism that creates this huge gap in between the wealth. Um, by creating huge gaps in between people like Francis Cabot Lowell and uh, Seth Luther, ultimately what they felt this was doing was really politically empowering the class of Americans that own the factories and in the South own the fields and own the big plantations. And they're beginning to push back against this. Um, part of this pushback does involve the emergence of unions. We've talked about that in this lecture, and we will continue to see um, what you would probably call class conflict in the con uh, context of unionism. They're also pushing back in terms of theory. In particular, many of these guys are pointing to what they call the labor theory of value by, by saying any, anything that has value, a coat, a pair of shoes, a, a pencil even, um, it has value because some worker has imposed his or her intellectual order upon it. Otherwise, all a pair of shoes would be would be scraps of leather, some stitching, some leather. Um, nobody would pay anything for it. And what they were arguing through this labor theory of value is any additional value that somebody receives from the sale of that shoe, whatever, whatever it is that you're talking about, that added value ought to be given to the worker. That was the labor theory of value. Labor ought to be rewarded for it, not capital, right? So this conflict will continue on into the future, and you will see this spilling over into politics. Um, by the 1820s, I think it's pretty fair to say, guys, that people have figured this out, and they're beginning to realize, they're beginning to make the connection that sometimes when government acts, um, it can hit you in your wallet. It can hit you in your pocketbook. And once people are beginning to make that connection and that realization, they are going to turn to what, what I will call populist politicians um, in American political life, men or women of the people. And you'll certainly see what I'm talking about once we get to the election of Andrew Jackson. For right now, guys, that's where I want to leave it.